I don't know about you guys, but whenever I would pick up a new video game, I'd take forever. And I mean forever to choose my character. I mean, I remember getting my first Pokemon game and taking a good 20 minutes to choose between the grass, fire, and water type Pokemon. It sounds ridiculous, I know. But I think a part of the reason why choosing your character in video games can be so challenging is the wide range of powers these characters have, despite their almost equally interesting abilities. At the end, the character, or in this case the Pokemon you choose, will dictate how you'll play and strategize for the rest of the game. Okay, video game philosophy aside, how does this relate to viruses? Well, as we mentioned in the last episode, different viruses have different features and characteristics. Like our favorite Pokemon, different viruses have unique abilities, which set them apart from one another. Knowing this is important because these different characteristics not only influence the way viruses attack our cells, they also impact the way our body responds to an infection and our ability to make medication and vaccines to fight them off. With that, today's episode will focus on the molecular biology of our two main characters, coronavirus and HIV. We'll discuss their general structures and their general functions, which determine how they infect our cells. Once again, this is Mathab, and this is episode 2 of a 5-part series sponsored by the CBR. And without further ado, let's jump into it. So what we have here are actual images of both SARS-CoV-2 and HIV. Last episode, we mentioned how the word corona means crown in Latin. With the image on the left, you can actually see the little spikes on the virus which resemble a crown. So what we're going to do for the rest of the episode is focus a little more on structures like these spikes and give some more detail on their functions. We'll go about this by kind of working through the structure of both viruses bit by bit. We'll talk about the outer layer of the viruses first, followed by their docking proteins, discuss the genome, structural proteins, and other viral agents. Now when I say the word protein, I don't exactly mean the protein powder you take to build muscles. In biological terms, proteins are molecules that things like our cells and viruses for that matter, construct to survive and carry out basic functions. Many of the structures that make up viruses and even our cells are made out of proteins. Okay, so on the blue shaded side, we'll look at the structure of the coronavirus and on the red side, HIV. Proteins usually serve many different functions, but today we'll look at their main ones and what they do in a general sense. The first thing we'll talk about is the outer layer of these viruses. Both of them have what's called a lipid membrane, and some structures will be common to both viruses, like this one. The membrane you can see here is free-flowing, or fluid, in a way. But despite this, the membrane offers protection to these viruses. Let's look at this outer layer in a little more detail. The layer is made out of something called lipids, which are a type of molecule. Uh, fat molecules, for example, are a type of lipid. But anyways, we can see how they look like when we zoom into the layer a little bit more. Each lipid looks like a little ball with two tails attached to it, and together these lipids make two separate layers that face opposite sides. This layer helps the virus in infecting cells while offering protection and stability. Actually, the outer layer of our cells is similar to viruses and is arranged in roughly the same pattern. This is a part of the reason why the virus can fuse with our cell and allow the, virus, the, the viral genetic material to enter, causing an infection. However, this layer can be disrupted with soap or disinfectants, like um, you know household items we use to uh, keep our surfaces clean, like bleach. And in a way, the soap molecules compete with the lipids and weaken the structure of the membrane. So washing our hands with soap and water can totally dissolve this outer layer and destroy the virus. That's why washing our hands with soap is so important. Okay, so we talked about the outer layer for both of these viruses, but viruses first need to dock with a cell in order to infect it, right? So in both viruses, the structures that allow them to fuse with our cells are called glycoproteins but they have uh, different structures in both of these viruses and have different names. 
All right, so in the coronavirus, they're called spike proteins or S proteins for short. And in HIV, the dog proteins are just called glycoproteins. Um, sometimes they're called uh, GP proteins, uh, which is just short for glycoprotein. Both of these proteins are important in allowing for entry in the cell. So in that sense, they act as a key to unlock the cell so the virus can ultimately cause an infection and hijack the cell's machinery. Uh, both of these proteins bind to something called receptors, which are found on the surface of our cells. These receptors activate other proteins to allow the virus inside. Um, in the case of the coronavirus, the spike protein binds to a receptor called ACE2, which is found on a number of our organs, especially um, uh, in, in really high number on our lungs and kidneys, for example. And the virus binds to the receptors and is able to enter the cell. HIV has been known to bind to another receptor found on specific cells that are part of our immune system called CD4 T cells. They get the name CD4 because the CD4 receptors can be found on the surface of these cells. I should mention that these receptors don't just exist to allow these viruses to enter. They serve other functions which are important for our cells. But these viruses are able to trick our cells in allowing these viruses in, even though they are intruders. But without these specific receptors, the viruses can't enter the cell. So we would expect the coronavirus to be unable to enter the cell by binding to a CD4 receptor and HIV to be prevented from entering, uh, from entering the cell by binding to an ACE2 receptor. All right, so we just talked about the docking proteins. Last episode, we ended on a question about the genetic code of a virus. So let's talk about that. We asked whether the genome of viruses, which act as instruction manuals to make different structures, are made out of DNA or RNA. The answer is both. Viruses can have their genomes made out of RNA or DNA, but never both at once. And in the case of the coronavirus and HIV, their genomes are made out of RNA. So what's the difference between DNA and RNA? Well, RNA is made from DNA, which allows us to make proteins. So basically, going from the instruction manual, which lays out steps to make proteins, to actually making them is a two-step process, and it's called the central dogma. So let's think of this in terms of making a meal from your favorite recipe book. The DNA would be the actual recipe book that lays out all the steps to make a meal from a certain page. Let's say you then make a photocopy of the page because you don't want to spill anything on the actual cookbook when you're cooking because that wouldn't be fun. This photocopy represents the RNA. Finally, you go through the steps on the photocopied paper and actually make the meal. That meal is what represents the protein in the central dogma, which is the final product of this process. How does this process happen in our cells though? Well, our cells contain its DNA in a compartment called the nucleus. It's here where the DNA is copied to make RNA. The RNA is then transported outside of the nucleus where it's used as instructions to make proteins by a machine called a ribosome. And ribosomes are one of those cellular machines we talked about last episode in this big, gigantic factory of a cell. Uh, and so, HIV and coronavirus use their RNA to make more viral proteins by using our ribosomes. However, the way they go about doing this is different for both of these viruses, which we'll touch on really soon. But it's important to talk about the proteins that give the virus its structure and serve as additional protection to the genome. The genome of both SARS-CoV-2 and HIV is bound to proteins called nucleocapsids. HIV has additional proteins called capsid proteins, which form a cone-shaped coat around the genome. And it also has something called the matrix proteins. So let's look into these proteins a little more. In both SARS-CoV-2 and HIV, the RNA is bound to nucleocapsid proteins, which provide protection and assist in viral assembly. So this protein seems to serve very similar functions in both viruses. The capsid is observed in HIV, and it provides an extra layer of protection for the RNA once the virus makes its way inside cells. 
Actually, if you remember that real image of HIV from earlier, and I have it right here, you can make out the capsid within this red circle. It's that dark spot you see right in the middle. And then beyond this, HIV has additional structural proteins called matrix proteins, which play a crucial role when making new viral particles. They line the inside of the virus and play a role in the, in the release of um, new particles from the infected cell. So a common theme we see with these proteins is that they kind of help to package and protect the genomes of these viruses. Similar to a box that holds our orders when we buy something from online, for example. Here, the outer layer can be thought of as the box that contains the genome. And when I say the outer layer, I mean that lipid membrane we were talking about earlier. And then something like the capsid can be thought of as bubble wrap, which ensures the genome inside the box remains secure. And then maybe the matrix proteins can be thought of as packing peanuts that fill the empty space inside the box and give support. These proteins also play a role in delivering the RNA inside our cells to make more viral particles, similar to how our shipments get delivered and sent to specific locations like our home. But to get our orders delivered, we need shipping labels to direct them to a specific location, right? So if we need you know, the, the package to come to our house, we need a label that specifies that. So these can be thought of as docking proteins we talked about earlier, which direct the virus to their target cells. The final element of our viruses left to talk about are the proteins that play a role in the virus's life cycle. For coronavirus, we'll focus on two small proteins called the membrane protein, or sometimes called the M protein, and the E protein, which stands for envelope protein. For HIV, the main viral agents are reverse transcriptase, integrase, and protease. As mentioned earlier, the virus releases its genetic code into the cell it infects. This is no different for the coronavirus. Directly from this viral RNA, our cells, ribosomes, um, help make viral proteins. The coronavirus makes around 27 proteins, including the spike proteins and the nucleocapsids we just talked about earlier. But two other important proteins that are made are the M and E protein. These two proteins play a critical role in turning the host cell into workshops to create new viral particles, and they're required for the assembly of viral copies. HIV has very different viral agents, and therefore the process of building viral proteins is quite different. When HIV releases its genome into the infected cell, the RNA actually gets transformed into the DNA, which is then integrated into the DNA of the cell. How can this happen? This is made possible through the action of two of the special HIV viral agents mentioned earlier. The first one, called reverse transcriptase, uh, uses the RNA strand of HIV and makes DNA. The name reverse transcriptase makes sense here because it does the reverse of what our cells usually do. Remember, our cells make RNA from DNA, but here, the virus makes DNA from its RNA. This new HIV DNA is then transported into the nucleus, which is where our DNA is, and it is integrated into the genome with the help of an enzyme called integrase. Once the HIV DNA is, uh, becomes a part of the cell's DNA, the cell is infected for life. So even though the cell now has the HIV's genome in its own DNA, the cell continues to make RNA and proteins for the cell, like it usually does. But since the cell cannot differentiate between its own DNA and the HIV DNA, it produces viral RNA, and therefore it makes the viral proteins. So a third special agent that is important in the HIV's life cycle is protease, which processes the proteins and makes sure the new HIV particles are ready to infect other cells. And there we have it. We have just gone through some of the major structures of both of these viruses, while briefly talking about their important roles. As we mentioned earlier, like our favorite Pokemon and there's Pikachu, these viruses have different abilities which determine how viruses infect our cells. But Pokemon can always get defeated by a certain move or an attack. And in our case, we can find ways to defeat these viruses through our immune system, which we'll talk about in our next episode.
So like last time, I want to leave you with a question for our next topic. You may have heard about the word antibody before, and it does have something to do with the immune system. But what exactly? Does it cause an infection? Does it identify and destroy intruders like viruses? Does it create cells or does it stop our immune system? We will answer this in our next episode. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you soon. Good luck.